I'll point out a, a specific example, um, and we could talk about it. your use of, in creation of Tableau. Tableau on stage, for me, disappeared around 1886 because it was part of that style. When I've watched you develop the Tableau, as the act comes to the end, the music finishes, and all the characters go into a Tableau, you have in a way created an emotionality and uh, a moment about those people on stage that now hits me emotionally. And I think, how have you done that? Because you are doing it within that con construct of that time, and yet you've, you've made something happen in that collectivity on stage, in that image, and creating that tableau that is a fresh and relevatory for me. But you see, I think it's fresh, Robert, because we're not used to seeing it on stage any longer. Everyone I see tableaus on the hockey yes. rink. I see tableaus when they Precisely. score goals. I see tableaus when they cut to the uh, Hockey yes, Night North uh, my Canada the, audience. Yes. Uh, I mean, so, but we don't do that on theater anymore, no. unless you, maybe you're Robert we don't trust you do. It. We don't trust it. We don't trust it or we haven't explored it. Yes. People, well, I can again, go and see the, don't some... Trust the, they won't trust themselves to explore it because they think, oh, it's been done. Oh, it, it, it doesn't speak to us. Oh, it's so stayed. Oh, it's so, it's so affected. It's so... Well, everyone what's the difference then? Because sometimes I go and see, uh, you know, a well-done opera of the 19th century and yes, the chorus is doing that at the end and I go, <laughs> yeah, well, that's a bit 1886. Yes. It doesn't do anything for me. Well, and I then I go and see a tableau that you've created at the end of that act, and I'm struck emotionally. What's the difference? I think part of it is what, getting back to what we were saying before, it's about being articulate. It's not just about creating a pretty picture. It's like all of the Baroque painters. Everyone knew how to paint. Not everyone created great paintings. But everyone knew how to draw, all, all painters, uh, everyone who was painting and drawing had a certain level of expertise. But it becomes a question of being articulate. What are, you, what are the bodies saying? What do you want them to say? Uh, are they being articulate? Yes, are and the that, individuals articulate yes, within the collective as yes, well? and it yeah. is individuals within a collective. And it takes time. It takes enormous amounts of time. It takes a, a, a very sort of selective process. It also, it means ultimately, everyone has got to be breathing the same air and be willing to trust, essentially, one aesthetic that is driving at that particular moment, one idea that is driving. That's why. There's not room for someone saying, you know, this doesn't really feel right for me here. I feel I should be doing X. Not to say that we don't try to accommodate But people. what's the difference then again to be devil's advocate? I'm watching a musical, uh, a musical theater performance, and yes, the chorus all mm -hmm. end up like yeah. that at the end, and I'm not struck. Yes, I see it's all unified. Yes, they're all doing the same thing, but I'm not taken and lifted. I think we're dealing with more profound stories. I think we're dealing with more profound music. ideas, more profound music, and people who have been through a more profound journey right. to get to that tableau. Uh, you know, for all of our saying we do not cultivate emotions, we have performers who are emotionally extremely attached to and uh, extremely uh, involved in the productions that, that we're staging. Uh, there is no, there is no dead wood. There's not room for any, mm -hmm. for any dead wood. Um, yeah, I want to point out one thing in case it isn't clear, and I'll say it: that working with you, and through doing Pygmalion and Andromache, and trying to understand those five or six gestures, try to understand that articulateness. It was alien. It was foreign. It seemed strange. It was a wonderful exploration, but in the end, it showed me, it put a mirror up to modern naturalistic acting. And I suddenly saw in modern naturalistic acting the same list of codified gestures, but in naturalism. Mm -hmm. I had assumed naturalism was just the way you were, and that's how people were, and that's how you act on TV, because that's so natural, and natural is real. Yeah. And what you did was you separated the style of naturalism from being real and truthful. And I see a lot of naturalism now on, on whatever theater and television mm -hmm. as dead, uh, codified, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> formulaic, yeah. uh, very formulaic, non-creative, yeah. uh, incredibly yeah. repetitive, yeah. and it makes me run from the room of an artist. And the actor has turned into a product. The actor has stopped being a creator. Mm -hmm. And it was exploring that style that actually threw modern style for me into intense perspective. That's and it's to f for any artist to use a style is fine as long as they know what they're in and they're free to leave it at any time. Yes. It's, I, would, I would criticize the broke actor the same way as I'm cri criticizing a television actor now. If they were locked in that style, yes. they didn't even know it was style and they were a um, automaton to that yes. style yes. as opposed to it's a creative choice to yes. express this way. It's a of means course. to an end. It's a means to an end. We're not talking about rules so that we can say we followed all the rules. I must be doing really well, right? It's you could follow all of the rules, whether you're a pianist, a dancer, an actor, and whatever style you are working in. The other day, we went and saw a kabuki performance on the Scotia Bank at the Scotia Bank Movie Theater, and uh, a very, very fa famous ballet called The Heron Maiden. We had never seen it before. The man who was dancing the Heron Maiden, who was one of the greatest, uh, greatest, uh, one of the greatest dancers in that style, was a man who must have been in his 60s or 70s now. We saw Stuart Jackson, the man who has that stupendous gallery of Japanese art in Toronto there. He said in the 60s he had seen this man on stage. He was already a star. And this was made in 2008, 2009, this particular film. So we're looking at a man who is probably in his 70s, playing, first of all, a heron, but playing a beautiful young girl, a girl who is, I guess, 18, 19 years old. It's, it's, so, it's so astonishing. It, had, it, it went so far beyond someone doing something right or doing something correctly. There were close-ups. You could see that he was old. He wasn't young. We were completely, totally drawn in. It was the most overwhelming emotional experience to see the journey of this woman who, because of her attachment to the earth, was not able to take the next step in the Buddhist cycle of being, but who was reborn rather than as a higher beast, uh, a higher being, as a beast, as an animal, mm -hmm. because of the love that had turned into hatred in her heart and she couldn't let go of this earth. My point is, is just, that man, certainly after all those years, I take for granted he can, has reached a level of perfection, but it has to go far beyond perfection. I don't know what a perfect kabuki performance is. There are too many things that I don't know. We know where he took us emotionally through an extremely rarefied, extremely um, artificial art form. And how these fairly rarefied forms then talking about the work you do in your company and Kabuki, how do they relate to 2011 aesthetics uh, admired in uh, video games and gaming and reality shows and yes, They're I can escape. dance show. They're an escape from that for intelligent people. We have a very loyal audience, always growing, many younger people. It's people that want to explore something other than uh, technology. They really <laughs> want to see what theater is and once they've seen it, they invariably come back. There they're, is they're an escape from that, but at the same time, they are, they're an escape that allows people to access genuine emotion. It's, uh, they're, they're an escape from something that is alienating, and it puts people in touch with very genuine emotions of their own. So uh, by escape, I don't want you to think that we're saying that we're, we're we're putting fantasy people into a, into a fantasy or a make-believe world. Right, right. It's not it's escapism. No, yes. it's an escape from, from technology exactly. yes. and the yep. emptiness of technology. Yep. Yes. And on the other hand, uh, or in addition, everything that you do now seems to have such uh, sumptuousness to it, such sensuality to it, and yes. such an aesthetic to it uh, that it's immensely attractive. Both visually, just whatever scene I'm seeing, it's immensely visually attractive. But it's somehow in the way you layer the light, the music, uh, the acting, the singing. And how do you but do But you see, that? Robert, you're describing what opera is supposed to be and what it was meant to be in the 18th century. It was considered the ultimate art form because it was supposed to encompass all art forms. 
19th century and eventually 20th century opera got to the point that opera was essentially a singing event. That's what anyone would tell you if you spoke to them on right. the street. In the 17th and 18th century and earlier when it was first literally uh, invented. invented, yes, they would have argued opera is a literary event. Opera is an acting event, it's a singing event, it's a costume event, it's a painting event, it's a machinery event. Right. It's all of those things, and no one element is more important than the others. That's why you could have singers like Sophie Arnoux viewed as having the most divine case of asthma in France. It didn't matter that she wasn't the greatest singer. They talked about her electrifying entrances, her breathtaking and exits from the stage. Everything should be coming into play, so be and the not just voice, 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 voice. So then to be the devil's advocate, if you were a modern Baroque opera company, and it is about uh, spirit, intelligence, uh, literature, song, dance, shouldn't also technology be added to that mix? But we do add technology to it, Robert. I know. Right? We're using technology that Baroque <laughs> people could never even dream of. Yeah. It's. Uh, Otherwise, we would just find some place like Walker Court where we would continue, could continue to light candles because it was a stone room. That was all very, very charming. We had a wonderful time performing right. by candlelight. But we can also create an impression of candlelight on stage using technology. And even that we have gone beyond. It's, as Martine Treed said the last time she came to Toronto and saw our production of Our Mead um, for our 20th anniversary, she said, you know, you're now you're about the perfume of the era. That's, that's what it is. And I, I loved that. It is, we're not trying slavishly to do something exactly the way someone else did it. We're trying to create an experience that stretches us as artists, that stretches our audience, and an experience that in some way replicates what happened at the same time without wanting to be a museum or a copy of that. We keep coming back to Balanchine because we admire him so much in New York City Ballet, which we both feel is the greatest ballet company in the world. Balanchine, every piece of his choreography, and he's certainly the greatest choreographer of the 20th century perhaps that ever lived, it, 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 is, all, it, it is all a reflection of everything that classical ballet should be, and yet he reinvents classical ballet in what now is called neoclassicism, a neoclassicism right, right. in ballet. They had to give some sort of a name to what he was doing.